Is the vision good or bad? Jesus said, Do not think I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. What does a sword do? It divides. The writer of Hebrews says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Paul says we should study in order to rightly divide the word of God. God divides the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the sinners. And later in 1 Corinthians, Paul even tells us, he says, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you be recognized. But the Bible contains extensive teaching on how wicked and destructive division can be. And we're going to see some of that today. But first, I just want us to remind ourselves of where we're up to. So, in my ESV Bible, it's a special one, not like yours. Mine has sections that come out separately that you can put in your pocket. Didn't originally come like that, but that's some of what time has done to it. But in my Bible, along with some of the Bibles we have here at church, it has a little introduction to each book. And so I'm going to read that just to remind us of the context. So it says, The city of Corinth was at the heart of an important trade route in the ancient world. Like many cities that thrive on trade, Corinth had a reputation for sexual immorality, religious diversity, and corruption. The church that Paul planted there floundered under all of these influences and began to divide over various issues. 1 Corinthians addresses many practical questions dividing the church, questions concerning such things as spiritual gifts, marriage, food offered to idols, and a resurrection. Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians from Ephesus about AD 55. So that gives us context for where we're at. And in the past few weeks, we've heard some of the greetings from Paul to this church in Corinth. But now, in today's passage, Paul starts really getting into the meat of why he has written to them. And we'll start by looking at verse 10. One thing I want you to pay attention to before we get into the rest is that in verse 10, along with verse 11, he calls the people he's speaking to brothers. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. He calls them brothers. These are Christians that he's writing to. They're his brothers. He loves them. And that's the reason why he's writing this letter. It's coming from a place of love. That's why our series that we're going through is called Love the Church. Because just like Paul, we should love the church. And he loved the church. He loved them and he wanted them to know that he loved them. That's why he wrote to them. But also, he wrote to them out of a place of love. Because sometimes when you love people, you have to say challenging things. You have to say things that are hard for them to hear. Things that they don't want to hear. But you have to say it anyway if you love them. And that's why Paul was writing to them, to his brothers that he loved. 
It says that he appealed to them. I appeal to you, brothers. The word here, appeal to, is parakaleo in the Greek. And it means to appeal to. But there's different ways you can translate this word. It can be translated as to beg. It can be translated as to invite. Or it can be translated as to encourage. And I think these three different translations can tell us different things that Paul might possibly be wanting to express to his brothers in Corinth. First of all, he's begging them. He's saying, I beg you, brothers, I beg you, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, don't be divided. Don't be divided. You can't be divided. And I'm begging you guys today the same thing. Church, we can't be divided. We're here as a church to represent Jesus Christ. So I'm begging you by the name of Jesus Christ. We can't be divided, brothers. We can't. We don't have that option. I beg you, brothers, we can't be divided. We have to be of the same mind and the same judgment because Jesus Christ's name is at stake. That's why we're here, to represent him. And we can't do a good job of that if we're divided. If we're arguing and quarreling amongst ourselves, then we're not representing Jesus Christ well. So I beg you, brothers, I beg you, we can't be divided. And that's what Paul was begging his brothers at Corinth. But he was also inviting them. Because to be united is a better way than to be divided. So he was inviting them, come on, brothers. Let's be united. It's going to be better. It's going to work out better because that's how God has designed his church is for them to be united. So when the church is together, things are going to work better. You're going to have more joy. You're going to have more peace. You're going to enjoy God more in a church that is united than you are in one that's divided. So he's inviting them to a better way of life. He's saying, come on, come and join me in this way of life. But he's also encouraging them. We can do it. We can do it, church. We have the Holy Spirit inside us. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can be united. We don't have to be divided. Come on, brothers. We can do it. He's encouraging them. In a sense, you could look at it as him saying, pull yourselves together for Christ's sake in the most literal sense of the words. He wants them to pull themselves together, to be united together as one for the sake of the name of Christ. And that's why he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. To agree, the word in its literal sense in the Greek means for them to speak the same thing, for them to all be speaking with one voice, to be of one accord in what they say. It's like when we sing together as a church, we hope that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. If a bunch of us were singing one song and someone else was singing a different song with a different melody, it's not going to sound very nice. But when we all sing in unison, then it is a pleasing sound to the ear. And that is what Paul is encouraging the Corinthian church to do, for them to be in unison in their thoughts, for them to all be thinking the same thing when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. For them not to be quarreling, but for them to be on the same page. 
And he says for there to be no division. No division. Not some division. Not even a tiny bit of division. But no division. None. Now this doesn't mean that he's saying for there to be no differences between the people. You can have a different taste. You can have a different style. You can have different preferences. But what he's saying is, these things can't divide us. We can't allow them to become divisions. Because we're to be united. And the word united means perfectly joined together the way that it's supposed to be. There's a lot of meaning in the original language that sometimes can be lost when we describe it as just being united. But that's what it means for us all as a church to be perfectly joined together. We see throughout Paul's teaching and throughout the Bible that the church is the body of Christ and each one of us is an individual member of his body. Christ's body isn't divided. It's united. Each of his members perfectly joined together to form the full body. And that's what we're to be, perfectly joined together. It's almost as though Paul was looking at this set of jigsaw pieces when he looked at the Corinthian church. And some of them were over here, joined together in a little clump. But then there was big spaces, and then a few of them were joined together over here. And then there's a few scattered down here, and then there's some joined over here. But that's not how it's supposed to be. He wants to see a perfect jigsaw that is complete, that is whole. All of the pieces connected. That's how the church is supposed to be. And we do that by being of the same mind and the same judgment. That's what Paul says. He doesn't say that we can't have different clothes, different slang and way of speaking, different mannerisms, different hobbies and preferences. He doesn't say we can't have those type of differences. But we're to be of the same mind and the same judgment, thinking the same things when it comes to God Almighty and his gospel. These are the things that we're to be united on. So then he goes on in verse 11 and he explains why he's appealing to them regarding these things. He says, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. You can almost hear the disappointment. My brothers, what are we doing? What are we doing as a church if we're quarreling when we should be united in the gospel of Jesus Christ? But who are these people that have come to him and reported this information? It's Chloe's people. Who is Chloe? Who were Chloe's people? Well, let me break it down for you. Chloe's people were people that were in some way connected with Chloe. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of scholars out there and historians who could speculate for days on who exactly these people were, but the Bible doesn't really give us that much information we know that there's someone called Chloe and that there were some people who were in some way connected to her. They could be her friends, her business associates. They could be the servants from her house, her family members. We don't really know. But the point is these people have come to Paul and let him know that there's quarreling going on amongst the Corinthians. They reported it to him. The word in the Greek is delato. And this word means for something to be revealed, pointed out, 
declared, shown, made manifest. So we don't know exactly how these things were made known to Paul, whether someone came and spoke to him about it, whether it was written to him in a letter. We don't know. But we know that there were people who were there who were privy to this information and they came and let Paul know what had been going on. And a point I want to make here is that if there is ungodly stuff going on within this church and you've attempted to sort it out yourself and it hasn't been sorted out, don't let it continue. Go and speak to the elders about it. Don't suffer in silence. Don't think, oh, well, I've tried to tell them and they just keep on doing it, so, you know, I've done all I can now. That's not the case. Things are not to continue in secret. The Bible tells us to bring things to the light. And that's one of the ways that we resist the enemy. It's one of the ways that we fight against sin is by bringing things to the light. Sometimes people won't listen to us, but then when we bring someone else, they'll realize, oh, actually, this is serious and I need to make some changes here. Maybe even after you bring someone else, they still don't listen. Well, then it needs to be brought before the whole church and it needs to be dealt with out in the open. Don't let things just be swept under the rug. Ephesians 5.11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Do not allow works of darkness to take place in this church and you just turn a blind eye. Otherwise, you are just as guilty as the people doing those things. It is your job to expose it. So there was quarreling going on and it had been exposed to Paul. But what was the quarreling over? We see it in the next verse, verse 12. It says, What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. So the quarreling was over the different leaders at the time. And the different camps, the different factions that had been set up saying, oh, we follow this guy, he's our leader. I follow that guy. And then there were some who were like, oh, we just follow Jesus. So Paul starts with those who say they follow him. He's not trying to separate himself from the issue. He's saying it's not just the they're following after these other preachers and they're doing things wrong. He's saying, no, they're even looking up to me in a way that they shouldn't be doing. Paul doesn't want the glory. He wants the glory to go to Jesus. But we have to keep in mind that all of these people are brothers. They're all Christians. It's not that some of them are teaching false doctrine and they're actually Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever. They're all Christians, but they're segregating within Christianity. They're debating about which leader is the best, which camp is the best, creating schisms. And this is nothing new. The Jews and the Greeks were already well known for doing this. Different schools of thought The Greeks would say, I follow Plato. Oh, I follow Aristotle. Oh, oh, those guys, I follow Socrates. He's the proper one. And the Jews were doing the same thing. The zealots. Yeah, mate, they're the proper ones. The Essenes. Oh, yeah, we're just chilled out and that. Those zealots, oh, they're too aggressive. The Sadducees the Pharisees, and then even within the Pharisees. Oh yeah, we like the teachings of Shammai. Oh, we like Hillel, his teaching. He's the best rabbi. 
But Christians were supposed to be different. They were supposed to be united. But some of them liked Paul because he had power. He preached with power. He performed miracles. And he had prestige. He studied at the feet of the greatest teachers. He was a Roman citizen. He was the top of the Jews. He had power and prestige. So some people were like, yeah, he's proper. He's a good one, him. We'll follow after him. Others were like, nah, forget them. All oh, high and mighty, Paul. What does he know? I follow Peter. You know, he's every man. You know what I mean? See him down the pub at the weekend. You know, we know him. We know he's solid. Good guy. Good, solid guy, that Peter. He's married and that. You know what I mean? He's holding things down. Not like that Paul. Where's his wife? Never seen her, mate. Peter's a Jew as well. You know what I mean? And he even knew Jesus personally. He was this Paul guy who's come on the scene. All of a sudden, after the fact, didn't he used to persecute the church? Oh, those guys, what do they know? Have you heard of Paulus? Have you heard his preaching? Oh, some of them words, I don't even know what he's saying. But it sounds amazing. He's eloquent. He's creative. The stories that he comes up with. Oh, flabbergasting. Such an intelligent guy. And then others are like, oh, all these guys arguing. I just follow Jesus. Not like you guys, following all these different teachers, and I just follow Jesus, me. But is, is that the teaching of Jesus? To isolate yourself and act holier than thou? To display false humility by acting like you're better than the rest? Doesn't sound like followers of Jesus. They're maybe the most divisive of all because they're making out that the other people aren't following Jesus despite the fact that all of them are Christians. But they're like, no, we're the ones following Jesus. But Paul was following Jesus. Peter was following Jesus. Apollos was following Jesus. And so were their followers. But it's tribalism. And the same thing happens today. Are you on the left or are you on the right? Are you a red or are you a blue? Politics, sports teams. People love to have a, a leader who they can follow. Whether it's a comedian or an actor or a musician or a celebrity with no talent whatsoever. A podcaster, a YouTuber. People love to get behind someone and be one of their followers. And to be like, oh, that other guy, oh, no, forget him. It's all about this one. People love to be part of a clan. To feel like they are someone, they're part of a family. They can all huddle together and point the fingers at the other ones. They've got it all wrong. We're the ones who've got it right. Look at our leader. He's the funniest one. He's the most successful one. He's the richest one. Oh, look at this woman. She's the most beautiful. She must be the best one. Oh, this is the newest one. You heard this one? They've just come out. Not heard their stuff yet. People love that, to be the first one on the scene of the new thing. This one. Oh, you don't know? You've not heard? Yeah. You're still on that old guy? Yeah. He's out of date. Others are like, no, oh, all that new stuff. Yeah, forget all that. This is the tried and tested, historically proven, traditional one. Can't beat this one. It's been around for hundreds of years. I think this newfangled modern stuff can compare. Whatever your preferences are, 
You can easily find a leader who will fit your tastes. Or you can find a group to join and be a part of. But that is making Christianity about you. Your preferences. What you like. Christianity is supposed to be about who? Jesus, yeah? <laughs> you sure? <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's who it's meant to be about. But some people look at Christianity like this. This is how to pick a religion. A consumer's guide. It's got a bunch of different categories in here. It's got a... Uh, Art and architecture, music, science, literature, family, sex, food, clothes, money, recreation, worship and contemplation, ethics, social justice, the environment, war and peace, gender equality, death and the afterlife. And what you can do in this book is you can flick through the different chapters, whatever is important to you in life. Oh, sex. I like that. Oh, what does it say about sex in this religion? Oh, oh no, I don't really agree with that. Forget that religion. Oh, this one. Oh, this one says you can have sex with loads of different people. All the same. Oh, that one sounds good. You can flick through and you can find whatever you want. And you can choose a religion to your liking. What a load of rubbish. That shouldn't be how you decide how to live your life. You should live your life based on what is true. Because at the end of the day, when you do get to that final chapter of death and the afterlife, all that other stuff will not make a difference. Your preferences aren't going to make a difference once you die and pass on. What's going to matter is what was actually true. Who is the real God? What is the right way to live? You'll be judged by God. But if you come to Christianity based on your preferences... Because you see things in Christianity that you like. Oh, there's really nice community. They're really friendly people. Ooh, I really like the singing that they do. The guitar, that bald guy. <laughs> He's great. If you come to Christianity that way, there's a big chance that that's how you'll continue in your Christianity. Oh, the ball guy's left now. They got another ball guy. He's not as good. I might go to that other church where he's gone. Oh, have you seen the other guy with loads of hair? He's well better. I'll go to that church. Oh, this guy, he preaches powerfully. I want to go to that church. Then you start going to that church. And that guy gets ill and he's not preaching as powerfully anymore. And then you see another one on YouTube and he's more powerful. And you're like, all right, I'll just go to that one then. And that's what these guys were like. They were picking stuff based on their preferences. And it was dividing them. Any true preacher of the gospel, any true teacher of the Bible should lead you to be united with Jesus and united with other Christians, not divided. The teaching that you're hearing is not helping you if it makes you feel like you're better than other Christians. Instead, it should humble you and make you recognize that you're in need of God's help and you're in need of other Christians' help too. I do want to know that Continual unrepentant sin or preaching of a false gospel are obviously legitimate reasons to leave a church or to dismiss a certain preacher. 
That's not what is being spoken about here in 1 Corinthians. It's not that Apollos was some sinful guy who was just living a life of sin and preaching false things. Neither was Peter, neither was Paul. All of them were godly men who were seeking to follow Jesus the best they could. And so that's why you shouldn't be divided. Obviously, if someone is preaching false stuff, you can divide yourself from them. So Paul goes on in verse 13, and he says three rhetorical questions. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? What's the answer to all of these questions? No. No. Well done. So we'll break down the questions. We'll start with the first one. He says, is Christ divided? The answer is obviously no. Christ brings love and unity, not bitterness and isolation. If you're following any sort of teaching or you have any sort of desires or preferences that lead you to be bitter or to be isolated from other Christians, then those are the wrong teachings and the wrong desires. They're not from Christ. Because Christ is not divided. If something is really from Jesus, it will bring unity with Jesus and with his church. We're in Christ. As Christians, we are in Christ. And if we are in Christ, if we are Christ's body, and Christ is not divided, then his body cannot be divided either. If we are genuinely part of the body of Christ, we cannot be divided. There is unity in the Trinity itself that Christ himself is part of. The Trinity, the word Trinity is tri-unity. So if God is a tri-unity, then what should we do? We should try unity we should imitate God. He is united, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we need to be united also. And the fact is, Christ owns everything. Everything in the entire universe belongs to Jesus Christ. So if we're in Christ, then we don't have to pick a side. Because Jesus owns all the sides. We don't have to pick a leader because Jesus owns every single leader. So we don't have to belong to a tribe or belong to a leader because those tribes and leaders belong to us in Christ. We can draw the good things that there are to learn from every different Christian leader, from every different group. There's no political party that is completely right and there's no political party that is completely wrong in all ways. There's always something that you can learn from people. We needn't pick a leader because he owns them all and so we own them all in him. In 1 Corinthians 3, 21 to 23, it says, So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or in the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. All things belong to God. So if we're in Christ, all things belong to us. We don't have to fight and bicker. So the second question he asks, he says, was Paul crucified for you? What's the answer? 
No. But Christ was. And note again that Paul uses himself as the example. You can see that Paul isn't trying to have a go at these other leaders. He's not trying to be divisive. That would be hypocritical. He's saying, it's not about me. It's not about them, but it's not about me. It's about Christ. He's the one that was crucified for you. Paul's not trying to throw the other leaders under the bus. Think about it. Think about in your life, who is your favorite teacher? Your favorite Christian preacher that you've ever listened to? Or if you've not listened to a lot of Christian preachers, who's the person that you've most looked up to? Who's been the biggest inspiration to you in your life? The person who has done things that no one else has ever done. Where you're like, they did that for me. That was so amazing. I'm so thankful they did that. Or they taught you something and you were like, I'll never forget that. That was so wise. That was so amazing. I'm so glad I learned that from them. Or maybe it happens all the time. You're constantly learning things from them. New things and you're like, oh, I have to keep going back to that person and keep listening to them. Whoever they are, whatever they've done, have they died on a cross to pay for your sins? Unless the person you were thinking of was Jesus Christ, then the answer is no. They've not done as much as Christ has done. So therefore, they're not worth dividing over because the church is the body of Christ. So if you're dividing in the church, if you're causing division in the church over what some other leader has preached or taught, then you're putting them over Jesus. You're saying that what they say is more important than what Jesus has done. And that isn't true. So Paul is correcting them for thinking that way. He's saying, listen, don't cause the visions because you want to follow me. I'm not that important. It's not worth it. It's all about Jesus and being united in him. Then his final question kind of leads on through to the end of verse 16. It's kind of all one section. He says, were you baptized in the name of Paul? What's the answer? No. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized, baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. So Paul's not exactly sure who he baptized and who he didn't baptize, but his point is, he didn't baptize that many people. And he's glad about it. Which is interesting, because the disciples were commanded to baptize people. But he says, were you baptized in my name? No. But they were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Yahweh, the Most High God. Paul uses himself as the example once again. You weren't baptized in my name. He doesn't want to be the one causing the division. Don't divide because of me. You weren't baptized in my name. Even if I did baptize you, it wasn't in my name. I was baptizing you in the name of Jesus. And the fact is, I didn't baptize most of you anyway. I got Timothy and Silas to do that. And I'm glad because now you can't, point at me and say that I'm the special one who baptized you he doesn't want the glory he's not saying we shouldn't want to baptize people he's saying 
if we do, it shouldn't be for our glory, but for God's glory. John the baptizer was the top baptizer dude. He was baptizing tons of people. He even baptized Jesus Christ. But he didn't even want to. He said, I'm not worthy. I'm not even worthy to untie your shoelaces. How can I baptize you? So the point is that we shouldn't be wanting the glory. Oh yeah, look how many people I brought into the church. Look at all these people I baptized. But the thing is, the issue here wasn't even with the people doing the baptizing. It was with the people who were being baptized. They were saying, oh, I got baptized by this guy. I got baptized. Oh, you only got baptized by uh, Silas. He he didn't didn't write any good books. Never even met him. I got baptized by Paul. You know Paul? Of course you do. Everyone knows Paul. That's who baptized me, mate. Getting proud. Boasting about who baptized them. It's not about who baptized you. It's about whose name you were baptized in, which is Jesus. Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, it says, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we are supposed to baptize people. But the issue isn't even so much about the baptizing. It's about the boasting and feeling like you're better than others because you're part of a certain group or you were baptized by a certain guy or whatever. Because these days... I don't really tend to hear people boasting about who baptized them. It's it's probably the first time you've really heard any sort of dialogue about it. It's not like you go and meet Christians and you're like, first time at a church and you're like, hi, nice to meet you. And they're like, hi, I'm Nathan. I was baptized by uh, this guy. (laughs) It's not really what people like to boast about. But people do like to boast about who they were taught by, what books they've read what Bible college they've been to, what church they've been a part of, what YouTube videos they've watched, what holy places they've been and visited, what Christian organization they've worked for, what Christian family they've got, and the great heritage. People love to boast about being connected with something I'm part of this. I've learned about that. But have those things helped you to become a humble servant of Jesus Christ? Or have they helped enable you to become an arrogant, boastful, proud, divisive, know-it-all? Because if they have, then all of your boasting is in vain. Because it's not actually helped you. The whole point of teachers and books and Bible colleges and etc. is to help you become more like Jesus. And if you're going around boasting about it, then it clearly hasn't helped you that much. To be Christ-like is to be humble. And to be a servant of Christ. To recognize that truly... You are no one. And the only good thing about you is Jesus. If you were baptized into Christ, then you should have died to slavery, to pride, and been reborn as a humble servant of righteousness. And this is part of why we're not in a terrible rush to baptize people at the Trinity Church. 
when someone comes to the church and says, oh yeah, I want to be a Christian, we don't say, right, jump in the bath. Jump in the river. Let me hold your head under. Because baptism isn't the mission. Just as Paul says, the mission is spreading the gospel, preaching the cross of Christ. And then baptizing people when we can see that they've truly embraced the gospel and they've turned from the self-centered sin by the grace of God. So Paul ends in verse 17 by saying, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. We see in Acts 18, 24 to 28, that Apollos was an extremely eloquent preacher. So we know that Paul is referencing Apollos here. But he's not trying to put him down. It's great to be an eloquent speaker. There's nothing wrong with that. But Paul says these skills of rhetoric aren't what saves people. What saves people is the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying that he wasn't sent to be an eloquent speaker. Apollos, he, he's that, he does that, and that's all well and good, that's his thing. But that's not my thing. I'm just here to give it to you plain and simple. Because if everyone was like Apollos, if everyone was an eloquent speaker, every single Christian who was out here with all these fancy words, then people might start thinking that the reason why people are becoming Christians is because of how smart these preachers are and how fancy the talking is. They've, they've talked people into it. But he's like, no. There's diversity here. But he doesn't want everyone to be like him either. Because then people might think, oh, it's because they're like you, because they're doing things your way. That's why people are getting into Christianity. The point is, there isn't one way. It's not a cookie-cutter Christianity. Paul wants people to see that it's not because of any specific attribute of any teacher that people are becoming Christians. It's not his own unique strengths. It's not the fact that he's doing miracles or living this very obviously self-sacrificial lifestyle. It's not about his prestige or his heritage. It's not about Peter's every man charm or Apollos' eloquence. It's the message of the cross of Christ that saves He's not saying this preacher's better or that. He's saying Jesus is better than all of us. Greek philosophers seemed intellectually superior to Paul and even to the gospel itself. To many of the Greeks, they were like, that message just sounds dumb. It doesn't sound clever. But the fact is, it was transforming the world. And this demonstrated that the power wasn't in the delivery of the message, but in the message itself. The truth of the message, which is that, although all of us are sinners, all of us have sinned, all of us have broken God's commands, we've all lied most of us have stolen, even if it's the smallest thing, we've all stolen in some kind of way, even if it's just stealing glory from God. Most of us have lusted or fornicated or committed murder, even if you've not done the act. Jesus said if you're angry in your heart, you've already committed murder in your heart. We've all broken God's commands. The lists go on being jealous, coveting, 
And because of this, we all deserve to be punished. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die. And not just die where you put in a coffin and buried in the ground. But the Bible talks of a death that never ends. A death in which you are punished for eternity. In hell, you will burn. That's what happens to people who don't know Jesus because we've sinned against God. We deserve to be punished because God is infinitely glorious. He's infinitely good. He's infinitely worthy of our praise and our adoration and our worship. Infinitely so. And so therefore, only an infinite punishment would be deserving for not loving God the way he deserves. So that's what we deserve. Punishment. But the good news, the gospel that Paul speaks of, the reason why Paul is out there mingling with these people is not to baptize people. It's to tell them this message that there is good news that although you deserve that punishment, you don't have to receive that punishment because Jesus came to this earth and lived a perfect life of spotless righteousness. Although we failed to fulfill the commands, Jesus didn't. He fulfilled all of them perfectly and earned righteousness. And then when he died on the cross, it wasn't to pay for sins that he had done because he'd done no sins. He was punished. He received a punishment on the cross worse than hell because it was hell multiplied by the amount of people that he was saving. And he received that punishment on that cross so that you don't have to. He took your sin. If you trust in Jesus, he took your sin on that cross and was punished for it. He was murdered, tortured, and punished by God the Father. The wrath, the anger of God the Father was poured out upon Jesus as a punishment for your sin if you trust in Jesus so that his righteousness could then be given to you. And that wasn't the end of it. Jesus rose from the dead to show that death could not hold him and death does not need to hold you. If you trust in Jesus, then you will rise from death also one day and you will be with Jesus for eternity, enjoying him with the other Christians, with the church, united in perfect unity with no quarreling, no arguing, together worshipping God, enjoying perfect peace, harmony, unison of thought and mind. That's what you will receive instead if you trust in Jesus. And this was the good news that Paul came to preach. And this is the good news that we, as the Trinity Church, wish to spread. We've been doing events recently and trying to reach out to the community, partly because... We want them to know this message. However, it's pointless. It's pointless to try to bring people into this church saying to them that this message is true if we're living in a way where we're divided with one another, acting as though this message is not true. I beg you, please, stop being divided Christians. Please. We can't afford to. This message is at stake. If we want people to believe this message, if we want people to realize Jesus actually has come to this earth, to die for my sins. He actually really did rise from the dead. If we want people to believe that, we need to live in a way that shows that. Otherwise, people are just going to think these guys are a bunch of hypocrites. They don't even really believe that message. 
Because if they did, they wouldn't all be arguing with each other all the time. If they were so blessed, if they were so amazingly in love with God, then how come they can't even get on with each other? We can't afford to be divided. So I beg you, and I invite you, it's a better way. How great would it be to be in a church where you come in and you're just happy to see everyone because you know we're all on the same page. We all think the same way. We all love the same God. We all believe the same gospel. So I don't have to be annoyed with these little things here and there. I know that those things are important. I know that these guys love me. How amazing would that be to feel like that every single time you come to church without exception? And that's how we should be. There should be no division. And I encourage you, we can do it. We've got the Holy Spirit living inside us. If we are Christians, if we're born again, if we have been baptized with Christ, if our old self is dead, lying in the grave, in the coffin, dead, dealt with, gone, buried, and we're alive in Christ, a new creation, then we can do it. We've got a new nature, a Christ-like nature. We're able to do it. It's a choice that we have to make, and God will empower us to do it. So we encourage you, we can do it, church. With much prayer, with much shedding of tears, with much fasting, I'm not saying it's easy, but we can do it. And also one of the ways that we can stay united in the gospel is by being like Chloe's people. By separating ourselves from those who are causing division. One of the ways to stop division is by division. And this is the last thing I want to read from Paul in Romans 5, 6 to 11. I read part of it before. He says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Let no one deceive you. If anyone's in the church trying to cause division, trying to whisper little things into your ears, trying to gossip about people, do not let them deceive you. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness but instead expose them so that's what I encourage us to do expose the works of darkness and turn to the light the light of Jesus in which we can all be united and we can all know that we will be for eternity. And any divisions that we have had will be a thing of the past. That's what's awaiting for us if we trust in Jesus. Perfect unity. So we're going to sing in just a moment. And hopefully we can sing in unison. Feel free to throw a few harmonies in there <laughs> if you so choose. But let's be of one accord. Let's be in unison of mind as we sing these songs. Worshiping the same God, believing the same gospel.